Hello, everyone, and welcome to the advanced introduction to scientific visualization with Paraview. So just a notification that we are recording. I have provided a link to the training page that has a bunch of additional materials there, the slide decks for uh, this presentation, and also that the uh, examples, and data sets, and things like that, that you can try on your own later on. What this workshop will, will, will be doing is continuing from where we left off with the previous introduction to scientific visualization uh, with Paraview. And in that uh, workshop, you got an introduction to both the scientific visualization, you saw how to uh, visualize scalar and vector data, and you saw how to do it using Paraview, and you got a sense of how visualization pipelines are created in Paraview, the kind of the components that make them up, the, the inputs, the um, filters, the views, and the output. And so you were able to kind of create your own visualizations from that. What we're going to do today is kind of take that to the next level. We're going to re revisit some of those topics, but in more depth, um, so that we have a better understanding, particularly of the data sets that we typically might see, understand a bit more about how they're, they're structured and, and, and how that interacts with what sort of filters you want to use. And then a primary focus of the the, the training will be on uh, how to take advantage of Paraview's programmable facilities using Python to automate the workflows. And that enables you to run Paraview on the, on the supercomputer, um, on, a, on a cluster of HPC machines, uh, right next to where your large data might be. And so it basically, once we start to learn how to uh, program these visualization pipelines, a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of different ways that we can put that in, in, into use. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Maybe before I start, I'll just mention that you, so you can ask your questions in, in the chat. Yeah, so you ask your questions in the chat. Uh, my colleague, uh, Thomas Thussel, I think is, is here somewhere. Um, he'll be kind of monitoring for it, just making sure that we can answer uh, questions as, the, as they come up. Cool. So. <clears throat> This is the advanced training web page for this. There's an outline of the topics we will cover, an estimate of the time that we will take for each of these topics. The programming one, we will probably take a break somewhere in the middle. There's kind of a natural break point and however we hit that. These numbers are kind of rough estimates. So uh, our times are rough estimates. So, you know, we, we may start earlier or a little, little bit later, depending on, on how, how things go. The workshop materials are here. I encourage you to, to at least get the programmable pipelines and the slides. There's also a bunch of other additional useful, useful resources, including uh, download links for, for Paraview. So Paraview is very easy to install. Typically just download an archive, extract it, and you're ready to go. That can be useful because you want to sync up the version of Paraview that you use in the cluster and on your local workstations. There's also a bunch of additional information and resources about scripting Paraview, tutorials and programmable filters, examples, um, and, and even you know a nice textbook on VTK. VTK is, is one of the, the toolkit that Paraview builds on a bunch of different tutorials and, and so on. The code will be in Python, but we're not going to require you know, deep Python understanding. But if you want to improve your ability to, to modify and, and uh, change these scripts and understand what's going on, and you want to learn Python, um, there's uh, two resources here from Code Academy and um, a Python beginner's guide as well. With that, I'm going to go to the first set of slides. What you should be able to see is, is a slide. Hopefully everyone sees that. Let's start our discussion with the data sets that, that are the, the input into Paraview so that we can better understand them. Because a lot of what we're going to be trying to, to deal with is large data sets. So fundamentally, when the data sets are, data sets are ter gig, multi gigabytes or terabytes in size, we'll want to, you know, so Paraview is able to scale up to those data sets. And so we want to understand how uh, a little bit more about them. Okay, so a review of our visualization pipeline that we have the data sources, the filters, the views, and the output, which you saw previously. And so right now we're gonna kind of focus on these data sources. One of the things that we're going to discuss a bit is that 
you, you don't have to always move your data to Paraview because Paraview runs any, everywhere. As, as mentioned, it, it scales out from laptop to supercomputer. You can move Paraview to your data. Uh, but one of the things you'll have to do is kind of load that data into Par, Paraview. And there's some wrinkles and issues and, and caveats and, and, and understanding your data set will help with that. Paraview supports a large number of data sets, you know, from all sorts of different domains and maybe you will see your data set there. Um, there's a, a link up, up top that is, is the list of available readers that Paraview supports. We're going to focus on just a, a small subset of those that a lot of users at Coast uh, tend to, to have. Basically, the, 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 there's kind of the simple data formats. There's you know, tabular data like in spreadsheets or raw data. There's semi-structured task text. Sometimes you can get like, um, uh, you know, poly 3D mesh file, and you can kind of see that you can, you can read it and look at it in the editor, or you might get structured text like uh, XML. There's also HPC data container formats, and examples of those are NetCDF and HTF5, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll look at those. And there's also different kind of data structure layouts that Paraview supports, and those would, so basically, all these other files are going to get converted internally into these, these data structures. And the data structure that it ends up getting turned into internally inside Python, inside Paraview, is going to impact uh, which filters available and, um, and performance. So we'll discuss that as well. <laughs> Let's start with the basics of tabular like text data, like a CSV file. The things that you will need to know to, to use these files are the headers, you know, so remove any comments out of the top of the file. Paraview is not going to, to read, read that. And you also need to know what the field delimiter is. So it might be tabs or commas, or, you know, CSV commas, uh, separated values, typically comma, but sometimes there's, there's um, other standards and, and, and also, you know, sometimes you have uh, strings that have um, might have a comma inside them, but they're they're quoted and things like that. So anyway, so these are the sorts of things that you kind of have to know about your CSV file, but you should be able to import it into uh, a pair of you. For raw binary data, you will need to know things like its dimensionality, whether it's 2D or 3D. You'll need to know what the, the data type is, if it's a scalar type. Um, you'll need to know if it's, you know, um, you know float or long int or, or unsigned character, which is like a byte. You'll also need to know its data extent as well, which is the, the range of, of its dimensions. And you saw that previously in the introduction to Paraview, where we loaded a data set and we had to specify some of those values. Most modern data sets keep this meta information with them, uh, because unfortunately, if you get it wrong, typically Paraview crashes, but um, because you, you get like out, out of memory bounds and things like that. So there are structured text files. So if you're trying to figure out what your the output format is for whatever tool you're using in your domain, you can start the research with the file extension that it defaults to. You can also look at the header of the file for, for clues. Um, so there's a command called head that kind of prints out the first 10 lines of a file, of a text file. And so if you can just look at that, you might, you might find some interesting header information there. If it's a bunch of you know, gibberish and funny characters, it might not be text, it might be a binary file instead. Uh, but if it's a text file, you might find something interesting at the beginning of the file that gives you a hint as to what it is. There's also a wonderful command on Linux called file, which knows about a bunch of different file formats and is able to kind of uh, look for things like magic cookies and other indicators inside the file that tells it what type of file that is. And that might tell you something more about the data file that you have. If you have, you know, some kind of some, some simple data format and you know the name and the extension of the data format, you know, just use the correct file extension, the kind of the standard one. And if pair of you knows it, it should be able to read it in. Now, sometimes there are multiple uh, readers available. So you can look in the pair of you documentation to see which one of those would be the appropriate version. Now, if pair of you doesn't support your data format, then you're going to have to have some, there's some options. So one is just to write out the data in a different format or find conversion tools. This, it's kind of a domain dependent 
tool dependent sort of thing. So whatever kind of data set formats are, are common in your field, that's kind of where you want to start looking. And we're also available to help. So if you're having trouble getting your data into Paraview, please contact us. There's also more complex data formats. Uh, we'll call them HPC data formats that um, let's encapsulate a bunch of different data together. They provide a lot of different meta information and they have characteristics that are well suited for HPC. Um, they're scalable. You can access you know, a small subset of the large data. You don't have to read all the way through to, you know, to, to find the, the, the record of, of, of the size of data of interest. And they also enable parallel, parallel uh, processing. So they tend to also be more complex. They may contain a lot of different metadata describing what the main data is inside the file. Uh, they may support heterogeneous data types uh, and have their own internal organization. Um, and typically they will also come with libraries, APIs, and sometimes just an ecosystem of tools to work with these, these formats. So we're going to talk about two. The first one is NetCDF. It's a, a data format that's self-describing. So it's meta information is contained. It knows about uh, variables and time steps and, and extents and all sorts of things like that. It's portable. Um, which means that no matter which system you go to, it'll be read the same way. Some, so this isn't really a concern for us at Coast uh, because all our systems are x86. I think that's a little Indian. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if you go to other systems, the order in which the bytes are written out will, may, may change. And, you know, if, if the data file was written on one system, but then read on another, you kind of end up corrupting that data if the data format doesn't record uh, the endianness, for example, of the data. There's that portability. Um, and also the tools are available on multiple different types of systems, whether it's your own workstations or the clusters. And it's designed to be scalable. It's also designed to be a, a appendable, which is a useful property when you're writing these files out, shareable, archivable. So the nice thing with it is that, you know, you can test you know, you, you, it's easy to, to, to transfer the file. It's a single large file as opposed to, um, you know, a whole directory string of loose files. And it has its own data access libraries as well. It's often used for climate and weather simulation results. So for example, it's typically was generated by WARF. Now, a, a caveat thing to, to, to be aware of is that Paraview requires that NetCF files follow the, the CF conventions. Uh, and there's a link to the um, web page which describes them. And this means that time is both a dimension and a variable. Now, what happens if it's not? So what happens is that um, if it's not this way, if it's just a dimension, it will show up in the dimensions list. And so it'll be like, a, instead of being, you know, like, you know, your X, Y, Z, and then you have like a time series of that, it'll, you'll have sort of like a 3D data set that kind of varies over time. Paraview won't understand that there's a time dimension. It'll just think that time is like the fourth dimension of this data set and it's all together. Yeah, so, so by, by making sure that this is set correctly in the NetCDF uh, file itself when it's written uh, and you follow these conventions, Paraview will know um, that this is part of a time series and will be able to process, process it appropriately. So NetCDF comes with a bunch of utilities. Two of them are, well, there's a few more. Um, so NC Info will give you information about the uh, metadata information in the files. For example, their dimensions and whether things are a variable or a dimension. NC Dump uh, lets you also get kind of a text representation of, um, of what's inside that file. There's also ways to combine multiple NetCDF files together or NC Kitchen Sink, uh, NCKS, uh, the you know, NetCDF Kitchen Sink, uh, is a multi-purpose NetCDF tool that you can do al almost anything with. It's programmable. It's a little complicated, but it allows you, for example, to slice variables out of out of the files uh, if you need that. And by the way, when you if you do do this sort of extraction of variables out of your data files, you should do it on the cluster itself or on the supercomputer. You don't want to copy the huge file over to your workstation and then do the work there. You want to basically bring the tool to where uh, the data is. Another little potential issue with a NetCDF when WARF, for example, writes out um, its data files. So 
a pair of you has its own idea of what constitutes a time series. Um, and it's kind of reasonable. And basically it's the sequence of numbers that are the suffix before the extension of the file. Um, so, you know, in the example here, you know, you can have a bunch of name and other information, but once you get to the numbers at the end of this file name, that indicates time series. Now, so WARF by default, I think, doesn't put on a, a .nc extension. So that will be an issue with Paraview when it tries to load it, it doesn't know which reader to use. And so you have to make sure to pick the right one. But if you put an, ex an extension on those files, Paraview will know. Um, the other thing is, is that when WARF prints these files out, they tend to be, the, the, there is a number at the end, but it's kind of like a, a date and a time which doesn't quite get read as, as a sequence by, by pair of you. So one of the tricks that you can use, you, you don't want to have to go and rename your original data files, you want to keep them, is just to create another directory that's like a view and use ln-s, which is so ln is for link, so and s is a soft link. So basically you create a directory that's a soft link to the original files, but the new the, the names of the, of the linked files have the right format. They have the right extension. They have kind of the, the you know the sequence in order, and that's the sort of thing that you can do with a little bit of, of, of batch scripting. But once you have that directory of files with the right extension and in the right order, it becomes easier in Paraview just to load all of them at once as a time series. And if you have issues with working with NetCDF files with Paraview, please come and ask for help. we we'd be happy to do that. Okay, let's talk about the next file format, um, HPC file format, um, HDF5. This is a container that just holds arbitrary data objects. Typically, you will use it when you have large, complex, especially heterogeneous, esoteric type of data, but you require, you know, parallel I.O., random access, and a bunch of other good HPC type uh, properties. You know, it's sometimes used for project formats. It's 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 a very generic type of type of uh, file format, which actually is a little bit of an issue because you can almost put anything in there, and it's a little bit like a directory structure. You know, so you can have, you know, folders and subfolders and directories and <clears throat> different files of all sorts of different types. So with NetCDF. It was quite structured, you know, there had to be variables and they had to have extents and things like that. Uh, but this is, is quite generic. So there are a bunch of utilities that you can use to help understand what's inside these files. Uh, H5 dump uh, lets you, know, for example, look at the headers, which basically gives you an indication of the directories and the files and that sort of thing. Um, a really nice one is, is HDF view, which is a Java based GUI viewer. And so you get kind of a view of this, you can open up your your um, uh, HDF5 files and find all the different sorts of meta information and, and data that, that it contains. There's an issue though with those files, with a, a file format, because it's just so generic. Uh, what is it that we should be looking for? What's the data? What's its, you know, how is its metadata represented? Um, there isn't any specific convention for how that's done. So what Paraview does is it, it can read HDF5 files, but it needs to be told how to understand what's, what's in them. And to do that, it uses uh, a technology called XDMF, which is basically an XML file format that's an ex extensible data model and format a specification type language based on XML. And it describes the contents of the uh, HDF5 file to pair of you. There's a uh, web page here that you can look for more information. I'm going to give you a flavor of what that file looks like. It starts off like an XML file. The interesting thing here is in the, the doc type specification where it says, you know, I'm an XDMF file. It also lets you specify paths to the files. And so you can basically, you can refer to these files, to the files, um, instead of having to refer to them by, by path or whatever, you can refer to them. Um, it's a little bit like having a variable um, that you can refer to later on um, instead of having to repeat the same information over and over again. In this case, you will typically see references to what that uh, HDF file is. Then we basically are going to describe 
the topology of the data that's going to be in there that we want, um, its geometry, um, that it's a you know a three dimensional uh, data set, the um, the range of the data that, that this is going to pull out, um, and then we and then we mentioned that it's a time series, if it's a time series, and then um, and then we'll tell a little bit about what that time series is like, and then we're going to start with a basically. Uh, all the data sets that are there. The so here's an example for the grid, which is kind of the first uniform data type uh, here. It's uh, for time step one, uh, which simplicity's sake we've we've um, specified its name as T one for time one, but the name can be arbitrary. The um, the grid type is uniform. We'll see kind of what these data structures are like. Then what we're going to do is we're going to specify a bit of information about that this topology and geometry is going to actually reference back to the previous topology and geometry specifications that we had at the beginning of the file. Um, and then we're going to talk about the attributes that we're interested in, which is typically the variables, their type, their precision, their dimension, and also the path to them in the particular data file. So if we look at, you know, we specify it at the, the very start, that entity data file one, there was some path to a, to a file. And, and here we're basically saying that, you know, that this particular data is located inside that file, but under this, um, you know, under the, the, the data directory in, the, in an object called V1. And we just keep kind of redoing, doing this over and over again for every time step. And it does get a little repetitive. So there's a lot of boilerplate consider using, you know, like a Python script to generate or talk to us as we have tools that can um, create this file for you based off of other information that you might have, like directory structure or uh, or net CDF uh, header information or something else. If you need to create these files, uh, please ask. Let's talk a little bit about data structures. So once pair of you has read uh, whatever file we've given it, it's going to convert that into some internal representation that it will use to then process or display or whatever it's going to, whatever the filters are going to do. There's a whole bunch of different types and they kind of fall into two categories, which is basically structured and unstructured. So let's take kind of a, a, a review of them. The simplest one and the easiest one to wrap your head around is the uniform rectilinear grid. It's just an array. The topology is implicit. There's nothing specified where these points are. It's just like their neighborhood. We don't we don't have to specify, you know, where those where these cells are in space. They're just next to each other in memory. All the cells have the same type. They have a regular layout. Uh, we save on storage because we only have to record the values, not their locations, and um, it enables some optimized algorithms, some algorithms kind of depend on this, especially when you want to split uh, data up between multiple nodes, multiple processes, it makes it easy to split this, this data up so that it can be processed more efficiently. The next one here is rectilinear grid. It's very similar to the previous one, except we now can add a little bit of information about where the different dimensions line up. The information about the position of the rows and columns and dimensions are not in the cells themselves, but are kind of like a little bit of meta information that's kind of given in addition to a uniform uh, rectilinear grid. You know, a rectilinear grid is basically a uniform grid, but has a little more, more information about it. And that information can be useful when it comes time to visualize it, because then you can kind of put the you can visualize the data in the right spots. An example of where this might be useful is in, um, let's, let's say, uh, like, you know, a, a weather output. So you might have the atmosphere, if you're going to represent the atmosphere, covers a large area, but it isn't that high compared to the area. So if you do a uniform rectilinear grid where all the dimensions have the same shape, then you might, if you cover a large land mass, you might have a very flat, you might visualize this, this array as kind of very, very flat and very thin, and it's kind of hard to see what's going on. But the interesting things really are kind of, you know, the clouds are rising up, and 
and that sort of thing. So it's kind of hard to see the, the structures that they happen at different heights. So, and one of the things that you can do is you just as part of, you can scale the output when you visualize it, but with a rectilinear grid like this, what you could do is you could specify that, um, that the Z dimension, that visually it was spaced out more. Similar to this is, um, is a curvilinear grid. And you can kind of see that, you, you know, basically you've taken your rectilinear grid or, or, and you've basically kind of distorted it even more. You've given more description to it about where these points are. And now the, the dimensions don't have to have the same size all the, all the way through. So it's still structured. So you can kind of see how you know, it's still underlying. There's kind of like a uniform grid underneath there. If you kind of uh, redistort it or undistort it, there's an implicit topology but now we have explicit point coordinates. Um, so there's kind of more meta information about where, where these points are, but all cells are, are the same. AMR is another type of data set. And this is basically a composition of uniform rectilinear grids. This can be maybe a, the, the product of uh, simulations where, you know, wherever there's more activity, something more interesting that they need to simulate at a higher, higher fidelity, they will use a higher resolution grid in that smaller locality, and then they might have an AMR data set. So now we get into the unstructured grids, which is um, very closely related to meshes, really. I mean, it is a mesh. And so it's a primitive data type. Um, it has an explicit topology and explicit point coordinates. So now every point has its own location, and, and that has significant memory requirements, because if you have 3D, you now have three floats for every point of data in addition to the data that you might store as part of that node. But what you can do is you can now store multiple, you know, different types of cells on one uh, point in, in the grid. And a variant of this is the polygonal grid, which is a specialized version of unstructured, um, specialized for, for, for rendering. There's also tables, a little bit, a little bit like, you know, uniform grids, except that now the cells don't have to be all the same. Um, we can kind of have per column types, you know, so, so column wise, uh, all the columns have the same type, but the different columns can be different. And we can convert them from like table to points or table to structured grid uh, if we need. Um, another type of, of uh, data set format is a multi-block, uh, which basically groups related data together and it's, it's basically composed as a tree of all the previous data sets that we've seen, except for the AMR one. And there's also kind of a grouping format for, for mesh data as well, which is the multi-piece data set. And we can find out some information about what format the data has been converted into by looking at the information uh, panel in Paraview, right under the uh, visualization pipeline. So on the left-hand side is an example of a CSV file that turned into a table. So its type is table. And the other was the, the square head example from previously, from, from, from the previous training, which was that, you know, the, the, the head, the head of the skull. And that one is a uniform rectilinear grid. And there's additional information there about the number of cells it has. And there's also information about its, um, dimensionality as well. Why is this information uh, useful? Well, because we, as part of our pipeline, you know, we want to get the data in. So now we know more about that. Um, when the data comes in, it ends up in a, in some one, one of these formats and which is kind of hidden from us or has been. So why would we care about that? Well, because the next stage in the, the visualization pipeline is to apply filters and different filters need different data formats. Filters are restricted to, to the supported data types. When you go to filters and alphabetical, only the filters that apply to the currently selected data uh, will be will show. In Paraview 5.9, it will also show kind of at the bottom of the main window, a reason why a, a filter can't be applied. And that'll give you maybe a little bit of a hint as to what sort of conversion we should do. If you want to learn a bit more about that, uh, the places to go, there's a link here to the, to the user guide. And there's also a pair of you help, which we saw previously for readers, filters, writers, uh, reference. And you can go to the filter section and find out a little bit more about 
that filter and the data types it requires as input. We find the filter we want, but the data that we've, we've um, imported doesn't have the right format. What do we do? Well, we need to con convert some way. So there's filters that deal with that conversion. Here is an example of some of the things that we can uh, search for under filter search. There's there's a lot of these different sorts of, um, you know, convert and extract and resample type of filters, conversion filters. Um, and so you can kind of search for them and see which one does what you, what you want. That's kind of like a, a, a good starting point to help find some of these conversion filters to turn something into the right data format for the visualization filter that you want. Okay, <clears throat> a few notes before we close out the, the data source data input sections. And that has to do with, with extents. Now we did see an example. So uh, Thomas gave an example previously. I just want to kind of reiterate that. When we have, uh, so filters require that their inputs have the same extent. Typically that's not an issue because they might only have one data input. But when you have multiple data inputs, or um, that does become an issue. And sometimes, for example, like in WARF, when it outputs, you know, the UVW components of, let's say, the wind, then it, it kind of calculates them on slightly offset staggered grids. And so their extents don't line up exactly. If you get an error when you try to work with these multiple um, data sets, something along the lines of the update extent specified, in, and it'll specify kind of what the input data quo was, is outside the whole extent. And so that typically means that what you need to do is you need to ex extract kind of the common subset, the intersection of all those different data sets. And you have to do that for each one. And you have to extract basically the same extent for each one. And it has to be kind of within the bounds of each of those variables. And at that point, you now have a, a new data set internally that has the right dimensions. Then what you can do is you can append them all together uh, into a single input or like a, like a, a multiple or into multiple variables. And the, and the image on the left shows you an example of how this is done for three inputs, U, V, and W, which are kind of the vector components of um, the wind from this data set, but they're, the extents don't exactly line up. So what we did is for each one of those, you see underneath it, there's an extract, okay, an extract subset. And that one, we got the same extent. And then what we did is we combined it all together into a single value. But that single value ha has you know, multiple arrays in it which is these kind of new extracted UVW. And that one we can pass into the calculator. So the UV and W are referring to the extracted versions. And you can kind of see that because the append attributes come from the extract. And now when we create our new UVW vector, that will work without errors. So that's one thing. The other thing to be aware of is uniform grids are much more efficient for visualization pipelines. And in some of the, of the filters, you can apply them to, to, to both, for example, or, um, or, or yeah, and, and they'll kind of automatically do the conversion for you. But if you have, let's say you have uh, a data set that's made from unstructured meshes, for example, uh, and you want to kind of explore, you want to create a visualization and part of the creating that visualization is a lot of kind of experimentation and iteration. You're trying different things out. And every time you make any change, basically you end up recomputing re the uniform grid. <clears throat> and it's just very slow, very tedious. But so what you can do up front is you can use a resample to image. And um, you typically want the sampling dimensions to be kind of on the order of the screen resolution. Anything more than that, you kind of, I mean, you won't get all the details. And for the most part, the results are very, very similar. If you've basically sampled at a high enough resolution, the results of running a filter on this uniform grid are very close, nearly indistinguishable. And certainly for exploration, it's much, much faster because now all the other filters hook up to this resampled image. And now whatever changes you make, the updates can be sometimes just instantaneous. So 
it, this can make a big difference and it's something to evaluate if you find yourself waiting for every little change to explore a visualization pipeline. Basically, that's a little spiel about data. You kind of have to know what it is, know what the formats are, know what it's used in your domain, know if Paraview supports it. Um, it's good to know about some of the caveats and things you have to do to support these common HPC container formats. And that knowing a little bit about the data structure layouts, particularly the two different classes, the, the uh, structured and unstructured, will help you understand when filter requirements aren't being met and what has to be done to convert uh, between them. So with that, I will, so let me go to the next section. We have now got our, you know, we now know how to get lots more different data types into, into Paraview, but there's still a potential is issue. The data may be too big to fit on our workstation, right? So, you know, typically your pair of is interactive and, you know, we can run on laptops, run on our workstation, but those places may not be the best places to work with very large data files. They may just, you know, if you have terabytes of data, it just isn't going to fit on the workstation. And, you know, copying data files over is kind of slow, not really a good option. Typically, you know, data is heavy and you want to leave it where it is. And you want to move the processing to it, which is actually a strength of Paraview. The other issue is that, you, you know, you, you might have a lot of data, but each data set isn't that big. So yes, you could process each data set on your workstation, but there's just so much of it. Maybe it's continuing continuous input from sensors or this, you know, or it's part of an ensemble simulation. And you don't want to have to kind of manually go and kind of you know, make your visualization pipelines and hook them up to the next data set and, and, and export the images of the movies or whatever it is that you're going to do. It's, it's tedious, it's time consuming, and it's just a lot of manual work. So what would you like to do? <clears throat> well, Paraview has solutions for this. Uh, one is, is that Paraview can, because it scales from laptop to supercomputer, can run almost anywhere. And so instead of moving your data to your workstation, you can move Paraview to the data. And typically, wherever there's large data storage services, there's also large compute services to go along with it. And Paraview can run on those, those, those compute services. But the thing is, is that these clusters are not interactive. So you can't manually go and just create the visualization pipeline the way that you had previously by interactively mucking about with it. So what you'll want to do is rely on you know, kind of batch processing and scripting, and fortunately, Paraview is scriptable. So we're going to start to automate the creation, the generation of the output. And in the case of when we have, you know, multiple, you know, lots and lots of data, even if we still want to run it on the workstation, because, you know, each data set, let's say, fits, but we can automate that process as well by scripting Paraview. So we can let the computer take all the time, do all the work. And then that frees us up. So, because it's not manual labor anymore. So, that's what we're going to start to explore. And we're going to talk right now about a workflow that enables that. So, kind of in, in preparation for that, we want to separate out two aspects of, of Paraview, which is the, the kind of the client user interface aspect, and then the server visualization pipeline processing aspect. There's part of it that we will need as part of the, the workflow that we will need to do interactively. After we've done our simulation and we have got our data, we will want to, you know, we might not have exactly in mind what's the, what's the best visualization for our needs. We may be dis discovering not just Paraview, but also the data set itself. So we want to be able to kind of iterate through and work interactively. But then we want to take that and we want to be able to kind of batch that up and run that you know, in the cluster, um, we want to describe uh, what we want to do as part of that, uh, that visualization. So Paraview itself is um, split into a bunch of different binaries that do different things. Um, there's Paraview, lowercase, that basically wraps up both the interactive client and, uh, and a server and a visualization server. And there's PV batch or Paraview batch, which actually doesn't have doesn't have the client side interactive. It, it, it basically processes Python scripts and processes them 
uh, uh, has the server process them. So the basic workflow that we're going to have is that we're going to get access to a subset of our data, you know, create and test the pipeline locally or in a system that supports interactive exploration. And we, and we will discover the, discuss the details of that in the next, next section. And then we want to run these, these pipelines on the cluster using the batch tools. That's kind of the basic outline of what we want to do. So before we just dig into that, let's just review our visualization pipeline. It starts from data source, goes to the filters, produces views, and then from the views, we get output. What we're going to be, be doing is we're going to create the visualization pipeline on the workstation. We're going to automate the loading of the data sources, automate the configuration and the running of the filters. The views, we won't, they're going to be implicit, right? So that they're not going to show up on a screen or in a window. Uh, but whatever the outputs are from those, those we will automate saving them back to the, to the file system. So Paraview is designed to be scalable, and you can move it to where the data already is, so you don't have to copy the data. So the other some other things about about Paraview is that there's a bunch of different operating modes. And in fact, it actually supports kind of a client server interactive with the server running on the cluster and the client running on the workstation. Unfortunately, the you know, the supercomputer and and uh, and the clusters are not well suited to interactive jobs because there's no guarantee when the job will start. It won't may not start at your schedule, and you also don't know how long sometimes things will take. So you, things might just be getting interesting, and and um, you're exploring some stuff, and then your job gets canceled. Right? If there are issues exploring your data on let's say on the workstation or accessing a slice or getting a subset of your data to, to, to make a, a, an example visualization pipeline. Paraview does support interactively working with you know the complete data set. The other thing that is available through KVL is through the facilities. Uh, we can also run Paraview on like, for example, the display walls. So there's a large 40 panel display wall. You've probably seen it in the showcase. And that can be used to, to, to show ensemble simulation outputs, you know, large size for groups of people to explore. Um, maybe remember from the previous uh, training when we looked at the multiple views of, of the same data set. Uh, well, you know, you can put all of those on a, on a very, very large um, display wall and see all of it at once. So that's another possibility uh, with Paraview. And if that's in the interest to you, um, you know, please just get in contact with us. So um, we're going to split things into workstations uh, and clusters. Um, so workstations tend to be personal resources. Uh, they're good for interactive work, but they're slower and typically limited access to the file storage systems. At, at least maybe it's not as performant. And the clusters, you know, they're a shared resource, batched operation, um, and faster parallel access to storage systems. And that's basically the place to, to process large, large data. Here's what the workflow kind of looks like. We split it up into the seven steps. The first step, number one, is to get access to a small subset of your data. Um, you don't want to process the whole thing, but you do have to get access to it somehow. And, and the work, workflow I'm gonna show you today, um, you don't actually have to do anything different to your data. You just rely on a pair of you, only reading the part of the data that it actually needs. But if, you know, even just one time step, uh, um, you know, the data is just too large to process on a workstation, you know, maybe then you would then have to extract or, or subsample or do something on the cluster first and then create these uh, kind of sample files. The next step is to actually work on the client, on the uh, interactive, on a workstation, to create the visualization pipeline that you want, you will turn that into a script, and then that script will have to be end up on the cluster. And the workflow I'm gonna show you, basically you will edit it in place so you don't actually have to copy it back and forth, um, but you will need this script. The cluster will have to have access to that script because that's what it's gonna run as part of its batch operations. Then what you will do is you're gonna 
have to log in to your so SSH into the front end node of the cluster or like you know, the front end of Shaheen and run your S batch jobs and create your batch files and run PV batch as, as a batch job and PV batch is going to run your script. And then what will happen is that, you know, however many nodes or resources you've asked for, they're going to run pair of you on the cluster, access the complete data set stored on the cluster, and then they will write that out back to the storage on the cluster. And those output files, you can then access either to the, to the remote workstations or your local workstation if you copy it over. So if you have a local workstation accessing the file systems is a topic we'll discuss, but mostly it's, it's you will have to look at the training for Shaheen or, or the remote workstations um, to get more information on that. So let's talk about the compute resources that you'll need and what we're going to use. So you'll need for the client, for the interactive stuff, you need a workstation. This is where you'll create the visualization pipelines. And what we're going to use is the IT remote workstations. If you haven't had a chance to try them out, they're wonderful. You access them via the browser and via the URL for them is basically my workstation, myws edu.sa. Anyone who has Unix uh, permissions as part of their COUST credentials should have immediate access to this. If you have issues, um, this is managed by IT. You can contact the IT help desk for this. What makes this a particularly great solution for the interactive um, de development creation of the pipeline is that these are very beefy workstations. You know, they have a terabyte of memory. They have, you know, one decent GPU um, on them, you know, pretty good D G GPU. And they also have, you know, they're, uh, you know, like 48 cores or something like that. So it's, it's a very beefy workstation. Now it is a shared resource. But it, it's um, there are interactive workstations, so it's not designed for people doing a lot of compute. That's where you know heavy processing, like super heavy. You know when people start using it, all the cores and all the memory of the GPU, and you know for hours and hours and hours on end. That's when you know that's not really what those workstations are for. People should should be moving their work to to the, the batch clusters, batch mode clusters. For the most part, these machines are beefy, they're performant, and yes, you are sharing them with others, but most people are well-behaved, and it's certainly okay to use them intensively, you know, for, for, for short durations, and there's, there's aspects of the um, processing the visualization pipelines that's fairly intense, but, you know, those resources get shared, and the, the time it takes will depend on how many other users are also running processes there, and you don't leave things running for like the whole day and go away sort of thing. Well, one of the nice things though about that the IT is that because it's a it's um those workstations is you can go away from your session and not lose it. So because it's shared and that you can be running pair of you there, but just leave it idle. And because all the resources are shared you're not blocking other people really from doing work. That means that, you know, you can go away, you can do a bit of reading on stuff, you can come back the next day and you still have your session and, and, and the context kind of preserved. So it, it's, it's a good space to do interactive work. The other great thing about it is that they mount the, she, the, the Shaheen's Lustre file system, and that is mounted at Shaheen. So slash Shaheen on, um, on the uh, remote workstations, you have access both to Scratch and your project directories. So the nice thing about this is that you can have, you just almost immediately have access to your data files. And you also, whenever you create your visualization pipelines, they just automatically end up on Shaheen as well. So when you go to run them, you can, you know, they're already there. And the nice thing is that, you know, the interactive tool set on those workstations means that they're a nice place to edit text files and batch files and things like that. The other th resource that we will need is the cluster itself to run the, the, the pair of you server. And this is where we will process the visualization pipeline with via a batch script. And if you need more information about using Shaheen, um, you can go and look at the, the training that's available from KSL. Um, let's look at the first step of our workflow. Uh, we will want to 
access the data slice. So for the most part, if the data is already in a readable format by pair of you, you can skip that, that first step. You can just go directly to the workstations, uh, go to the slash Shaheen mount point and just read your files in. Um, but if you need to like extract a slice or you need to do some file conversion, you don't want to run the file converter on those workstations. And the reason being is that um, the data path, the um, IO performance between Shaheen and the workstations is not as high as between as on Shaheen. So if you do the file processing work on Shaheen, it will be faster. You know, as long as the uh, files are in the correct format already on the cluster on Shaheen first, then you're ready to go over to the workstations. The next step are the creation of the Viz pipeline. You will do this with, uh, with Paraview. And there is actually Paraview already on the remote workstations. It's under the applications coast uh, menu. Now they have a, a slightly newer version than what's on Shaheen. They have version 5.9 and a small issue, but the um, ideally, you know, if, if you if you don't want to have to work around, you know, version differences between Paraview and the Python code that it generates, you kind of want to have the same version. You can you can install your own version there. Just press it's just download the version you want, or you can make some small changes to your um, script files, and I'll, I'll show you how to do that later. When you are done creating your script files and your save states, whatever your visualization pipeline, you'll want to make sure that this ends up back at Shaheen. And typically that just means that you will be editing these files in the Shaheen project directory. So um, I just want to point out that it's important to put it in projects and not Scratch. So Scratch on Shaheen is temporary and visualization pipelines are typically things that you will want to keep because if you ever rerun the simulation, you will you might want to be able to recreate your visualizations from the new data. And so as part of reproduce, scientific reproducibility, these visualization pipelines are very small, but really good to keep around. So you want to keep them on the, um, in, in the project directory. So the next thing is, you know, you want to connect to the, to the cluster and log in. And basically, you can look to, to the uh, Shaheen training. I will point out a few things that there's one less password to enter um, to, to log into Shaheen um, if you have passwordless SSH. And there's some documentation on the KSL website that will enable that. So that's just to simplify that, that part. Now, when you're logged into Shaheen, you'll need to create a batch file to run that visualization pipeline. And you can look at the uh, Slurm's information on the job scheduler uh, for more information about how to create these batch files. The new thing that you'll need is to know how to make Paraview available. And so on Shaheen, it's a two-step process. The first is the modules. So Paraview, KSL provides some default versions of Paraview, but we also build our own. And this is the version, these are the versions that we support. If we have the debug issues, we'll want to use these versions because uh, we have access to debug versions and we know what other libraries got built with them. There is a module system called slash SW slash viz slash xc40.modules. And all you have to do is use module use and then that path. And that now makes available a whole bunch of other tools. And typically you'll want to use the default or very latest version of Paraview. And in this module system, Paraview is capitalized. So you'll just take note of that capitalization. You'll need to add this into your uh, batch files prior to you trying to, you know, S run PV batch. Now, if you've logged into CDL or the CL5, which is the kind of the build node, the, is the, the Haswell-based login node, you can also get help from PV Batch. Now, there is no MPI available on that, on that node, <clears throat> so you can run PV Batch with no MPI um, so that it doesn't complain about, about those, those missing libraries and, and get the help for it. You can also run it on a, on a compute node if you've uh, logged in with an interactive session. PV Batch, a little more about that. So we kind of introduced it previously as the 
a kind of server side of Paraview. So it runs scripts, but it's special because it, it does it in a, a multi-threaded, multi-process uh, way using MPI. And that means that because it's an MPI application, the similar sort of guidance that, that KSL provides for running MPI-based software applies to PD Batch. And we'll see that a little bit more shortly. Some other things to note about Shaheen is that it doesn't have GPUs. Is visualization slower there? Yes and no. So we'll talk about that in a bit. So it uses Mesa GL, which is a software uh, rendering library for OpenGL. With the, so you may think so compared to it to you know GPU, the software rendered OpenGL is much slower. But you know rendering pipelines are only partly about the visualization; they're also about the data as well. And when it comes to loading data, Shaheen is substantially faster. Typically, as the data, so, data sets get larger and larger, the performance benefit from running on Shaheen is going to you know, outweigh the disadvantage of not having a GPU. So ideally, you know, you, there would be both. But at the moment, there isn't. But the performance overall is still very good. It's certainly faster than transferring the data someplace else and running it are running the visualization pipeline with the GPU because most of the time is loading the data. Now, it does depend on the visualization pipeline as well, but more complex visualization pipelines, a lot of what they do, you know, pr processing the data, you know, calculating vorticity and things like that, maybe things that are done uh, on the CPU and, you know, PV batch being a multi threaded process can take advantage of, of all the cores. So the performance is also very good. When we run, so to run our, so we will be creating, you know, a, 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 a sbatch job file that will run our PV batch. <clears throat> and so as part of that, we will have to specify, you know, the number of nodes that we want and the number of, of tasks. And I will discuss a little bit more about how to choose those shortly. We then, you know, typically run our batch file, that batch file is going to contain a command similar to this. S run, because it's an MPI process, uh, PV batch, which is the server side MPI aware processing tool of, of Paraview. We will want to force off screen rendering. So there is no X11 support on Shaheen or other typically other clusters. And they are built not to display uh, the output using the GUI into like a little window, but to render into an off-screen buffer. So we can, we can kind of force them to do that. And then we specify the script that's basically our visualization that wrapped up our visualization pipeline. And we will see more about that soon. How do we choose the number of nodes, the number of tasks per node? So typically what you want is for the number of nodes is you want to be able to fit all your data plus the pipeline plus extra into the, the memory of the nodes. Each node in Shaheen has 128 gigs. So you would like to have enough memory across all the nodes that you ask for to contain the data set itself, plus whatever extra type of buffers your pipeline is going to create or use. So maybe two, three, it depends on the pipeline, times that, that memory too few and you might end up loading a lot more data from the um, file system repeatedly, too many and your data gets sp spread around too many nodes, you end up increasing the communication costs. So, you know, basically computation is kind of a, a product of compute resources and communication. So, you know, if you increase the number of nodes, yes, you increase the available compute resources, but you also in increase the communication costs between those nodes. There's kind of a sweet spot, kind of a trade-off, and, it, and it's going to depend on your visualization pipeline. The other thing is the number of tasks per node. Um, Shaheen has 32 uh, real cores, PV batch being multi-threaded. It, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be split between, you know, all 32 cores as separate processes, it can just be a few 
and then use you know multi-threading to, to communicate within one within one process and so this will it will depend on your pipeline on the data set you can do a little bit of benchmarking to get kind of the, to find what the sweet spot is start lower and then work and then work up um, and then once you start losing uh, once once performance starts to go down, then you kind of found found your sweet spot. So, um, what is PV batch going to do on the cluster? Well, it's going to process your Viz pipeline, but do it in parallel. And so, it loads um, the data so across all the nodes as needed. So, so each node will only have a fraction uh, or a slice of that data. So, and the nice thing is, but with the pair of you reads that data, it doesn't have to read the whole data just to get that one slice out, which is you know, one of the nice reasons about having an HPC a data set. And then it spreads the, the processing out across those nodes as well. So you know each node is working with a smaller chunk of the data and the algorithms that the, the, the filters are being applied in parallel across all those all of those nodes. And then finally, you know whatever we've asked to write out, whatever data, as specified in the VIS pipeline gets written out to the file system. Someone has asked, what's the difference between PV batch and PV Python? We'll, we'll see that a little bit more later, but basically don't run PV Python for your jobs. Uh, PV batch is the MPI aware, multi-threaded kind of batch processor for visualization pipelines. PV py Python is actually more like a non-GUI command line interface uh, it's more like a client than the server. So basically, it's like Paraview. Like if you if you've used um, IPython, it's basically it's like IPython. So it's the Python interface to Paraview. It's it's not designed to kind of split your workload up across multiple nodes. But from the, from the user point of view, they look the same. You can take the same script and run them on either one. And so if, if you're just running in a workstation, then either will work. And we, we will see that later on. But what PV Python gives you because it's it's interactive. Like you can actually you you run it, and then you can load your 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 script. You can kind of try out. You can experiment with uh, Python expressions um, similar to you know IPython, and you can kind of inter interactively explore the, the programmable aspects of of Paraview. A uh, Paraview, the GUI client, actually has a PV, PV Python built in uh, via the, the Python shell. And we will also see that. But basically, PV batch doesn't have that interactivity. Like you can't just run PV batch and then be at a Python prompt and do stuff. You have to run a, 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 a Python script. Um, so yeah, so PV batch for a batch processing on the cluster. Uh, PV Python, if you want kind of a command line way to explore to explore the Python interface to, to Paraview. But for the most part, you know, if, if you can run Paraview interactively and you've got a, a GUI, you might as well do that in Paraview itself. The, the capabilities that are there, it looks nicer. You get better editor capabilities. And so hopefully that answers that. Okay, next step. After we've run our batch, our, our, our batch job and uh, PV batch has run our pipeline, we're hopefully going to get some output. And this output is going to be uh, written to the cluster file system. And typically what it creates, whether images or videos or the meshes or things of that, are typically much smaller than the original data. You know, sometimes for, for, for workflows, you know, you might leave your data on scratch because, you know, you, you don't want to store it indefinitely because it's so big. But the outputs are typically worth keeping. They're, they're small. Um, and th they can be copied over to your workstation to view, to, um, to explore, to add to your papers or whatever. Um, so, you know, you can use the IT remote workstations and access them via Shaheen slash Shaheen. And there's a bunch of different visualization tools and, and, um, and viewers over there, or you can transfer them um, to your workstation. And there's, there's help on the KSL HPC web, uh, website about that. The seven step process is basically, you know, from your workstation, you're gonna access a slice of the data. You're gonna create your Viz pipeline. That creation of the Viz pipeline is you're gonna do it 
just like you did in the previous training where you just it was all interactive right and you say you're, you're going to save out a state file uh, but then you're going to use the capabilities of pair to turn that into a python script and that script you're going to make sure it's on the cluster and available hope preferably in a shaheen project subdirectory and then you're going to log in to the cluster to shaheen you know create your batch script and then run that batch script and it's going to output the result to the cluster. And then you're going to, you know, copy that file back or to view it on IT or remote workstation to, to see what interesting things are in your, in, in your data. So to answer the question that was asked, I mean, kind of answered previous as well, but you know, what's the difference between PV batch and PV Python? Um, this last slide helps explain a little bit more about what it is. So, um, Basically, PairView and PVPython are more about interactive usage of VTK and, uh, and um, uh, processing data, where PairView is GUI-based, PVPython is command line-based, and, and the other tools that are there, PV Server is the actual engine that does the, the rendering and runs the pipelines. Uh, we've kind of ignored it because it gets run by the other tools automatically. Uh, and PV batch is basically uh, PV server plus that, that Python client. Introduction to the automation. This is the key part of that workflow where you create the, these scripts and both the, the visualization Python scripts and also we're going to discuss the uh, batch scripts as well. The programmable pipelines uh, archive that's on th that web page um, contains uh, under launchers there's um, two directories look and launches shaheen and you'll see two example batch files a, a job job scripts that will run pv batch our pipeline again we're going to automate why would we want programmable pipelines basically you know we get more customization we got automation options it's actually very easy to learn because Paraview's GUI provides tracing. So we almost, almost don't have to touch Python code. It allows, enables non-interactive processing. And it's important when we want to you know, process multiple data sets um, or when we want to run it on, on batch machines. And it also enables another type of, of workflow that you might not have considered where we can combine the visualization pipeline and the simulation together, reduce IO costs and use that to access like the internal simulation frames that we that normally don't get saved out. And so have visualizations that are based off of higher spatial and temporal re resolutions that the simulation is producing. We're going to look at, you know, basically how save and load state that we done previously. It's kind of the building block for the visualization scripts. We'll look how to start and end the trace and also how to, to run the, the scripts interactively, how to do command line and, and batch processing as well. And we'll also look a little bit at, at uh, programmable filters. Now would be a good time to download this. The, the scripts are designed to work from your downloads folder if, if you are trying to run them inside Paraview. If you're trying to run them through PV batch or run them on Shaheen, you can just put them in, in your Scratch username folder. It doesn't really matter where, it's a, a location agnostic. Cool. So to run Paraview, you're going to need kind of a, a Paraview and a terminal open. I'm going to go switch over to a um, back and forth between the remote workstations and, 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 the, and the slide deck back and forth. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the visualization pipeline and I'm going to basically open this disk out data file that we've used in the previous training as well. I'm going to make sure all the variables are loaded. I'm going to add a glyph, uh, make um, or the orient array BV, the scale array none, and hit apply. I'm going to end up with a visualization pipeline. So let me go and do that now. So right now you're, we are looking at um, the remote workstations and here um, is, is my, my pair view where I had you know done this, I had, I had actually lo loaded a state file. I'm gonna just to disconnect and clear this out. And let me just go and 
quit out of pair view completely. Okay, so under applications, um, Koust, pair view 5.9. Voila, that will close that. So my, my laptop screen does not have a lot of screen real estate. Um, so there's not a lot of viewing area, but if you work from a larger monitor, you know, this will work well too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and uh, open up that file. And so I'm going to go to I'm going to go to my downloads folder where this was copied in. I'm going to open up the can. And I'm going to check all the variables and hit apply. And then the next thing I was going to do is apply the um, glyph. Going to add a, a, a glyph filter to it. Hopefully, it's in my recents. There we go. I'm going to so the orientation array is going to be V. Uh, the scale array is going to be none. Is that what I had chosen? Yeah. And I'm going to hit apply. Voila. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and save that state. So let me see. So I've created this visualization pipeline. It doesn't quite look like this one yet. And I'm going to now go save the state, disconnect the state, and then reload at the state. One of the things that when I reload the state, I'm going to have an option as to where to look for these files. You know, I could just choose, you know, whatever location was what the original paths were. Uh, but because we're going to basically be taking the state file to a different location and, and on the workstation, Shaheen, the luster mount is under slash Shaheen, but on Shaheen is under slash luster. So the paths, the absolute paths are going to be different. So we're going to want a way to kind of specify where to look for the data sets. Um, and this helps make those, these visualization pipelines more generic. So let me just go, I'm going to um, save, go to file, save state. And I'm going to put it in my downloads, program pipelines. I'm going to, I'm going to put it under save state here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, so there's already some existing ones there, but I'm just going to call it save state. Voila. And now if I disconnect and basically kind of clear the session and reload that again, so I'm now going to go load state and I'm going to, this is the one I just made, save state. I now have load state options and I can use the ones, the defaults, or I can search for files under a specified directory. So let me go and, and do that. Um, and I'll also specify only use files in this data directory. So let me go find them. And that's downloads, pipelines, data sets. So I'm going to choose data sets. There we go. OK. And voila, my pipeline is back. So this part we already saw. Um, as part of the previous training, that, that basically that Paraview state file is the kind of document format for Paraview. It, it basically is the visualization pipeline as how we, how we store it, save it, restore it. Okay. Now we're going to get into, into Python. There's some documentation links here, which you can see and, and follow on your own. Um, they're also as part of that web page. You don't need a lot of Python, but you should have some coding knowledge to understand, because you will have to slightly modify these files. But for the most part, we're going to just trace the actions that we take in Paraview, and Paraview will write the uh, Python code for us. 
um, but it's going to help to understand a little bit just code in general, you know, <clears throat> what is a variable, an assignment, a function call, that sort of thing. So if you need more help, that's where you can go. The, the capability that we're going to use is called tracing. What tracing does is anything that we, any changes that get made uh, via the user interface are going to get recorded as their Python code equivalent. Not everything gets recorded. So for example, if you click on a menu or you click on something that doesn't change anything, you know, that doesn't get recorded. But things that actually do produce a visual difference or output are going to appear in the script. Um, now we're going to disconnect ourselves before we start the tracing, because when we create our scripts, our visualization pipeline scripts, we want to basically start from scratch, load the pair view state file in, then, you know, do whatever changes we want. Typically the changes would already be in that state file. And the action that's important is to, you know, create the output, either the, the screenshot or the animation or whatever. So we're going to disconnect, go to tool, start trace. We're going to choose the default options. So there is um, some options that allow us to kind of record more information, which if you're trying to understand more of the details and what's available to you programmatically uh, could be useful. In our case, it's going to kind of make the, the script file a little noisier. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you kind of want just to understand step by step, because you're building your own script file, you can go show incremental trace and then everything that you do that has a corresponding programmable um, uh, Python code will show up immediately. Again, we won't use that, that option. So let's go over to our pair view session. I'm going to disconnect. Now I'm going to start the trace. I have a whole bunch of options here, which I'm going to just leave as the default and go OK. So now we begin. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load the state. And here we are at that directory. I'm going to load that in. And I don't want to use the defaults. I want to make it search under a specific directory because um, later on I'm going to be changing that. I'll explain why. So I choose data sets and I also say only use files in those directories. Voila. Okay. So I've got my loaded, my state, got the visualization. It doesn't look that good. Let's see what we have to do next. Let's make some changes to it. So this we did, we, we loaded the, the state file. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the, this, this reader, the disk out ref is visible, which, which it is uh, already. We're going to uh, display coloring to temp. We're going to make the volume, we're going to make the representation to be volume, how it's, how it's rendered. Um, we're also going to adjust the color map a little bit, orient as desired, and then we're going to take a screenshot of it. So let's see what, what happens here. So let's go here, we're going to check select that. We're going to choose uh, temperature. Yeah, okay, now it's nice and colorful. We're going to choose a volume render. And, you know, unfortunately, you can see here, it's kind of hard to see that. So I'm going to maybe make the blue a little bit, a little bit darker. It's a little bit too. Okay, I'm going to orient it so it looks interesting. Cool. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a screenshot or yeah, so I got to file, save screenshot. And I'm going to choose um, the output directory uh, in my programmable pipelines and I'm going to call it screenshot. And it's going to be a, a PNG file. So 
right now the, the resolution is, is kind of small. Um, let's make it bigger. I can make it twice as big. Go OK. And we're done. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just stop the trace. And what I now have is a, is a file that has, it's a, it's a script that when I, if I look through it, I can see there's the load state and there's the state file I loaded. And there's where I asked it to search under a specified directory. And this is the directory that I asked it to search under. And this is the file that I asked it to load. And then I see other things in here, like you know, setting the disk to be active and then changing, getting the color transfer function because we change color. Um, I also see a bunch of things where it changed the, um, you know, as I was messing about with, with the points, um, I could probably get rid of a lot of those. But that's okay, we'll leave them there. Um, I see where I, I adjusted the, the camera position. And finally, I see where I, you know, saved screenshot at the end and, and, and what with that image resolution that I chose as, as well. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna save it into downloads, ground pipelines as a script. And I'm going to call it screenshot um, example. Okay. So now I have a script that if I ran would go in and basically do the same thing. Okay. So I've stopped the trace. I've, I've, I've saved it. Okay, now let's talk about some issues with this. So I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna use, okay, so I still have this text file here. So I wanna point out some issues with this file. And it's this right here. I have, you know, a full absolute path. And, and the problem is, is that, you know, this is a home directory locally on this machine. If I've tried to run it on Shaheen, it would be a completely different directory, right? So what I really want is I want just to have, you know, from save to save state on down, right? And, or just a, a data sets. So I want it relative to the kind of the, the project directory above it. And I, and I, I just want to give the, the, the name of the file itself. And also down here, I also, you know, there's an absolute path as well. I really kind of want this, right? So I have to kind of go and start modifying this file. Um, so one of the things that we can do is because it's Python, we can go and use Python to, 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 to to fix these issues. There's some other issues there as well that have to do with versions. So um, on Shaheen, there's 5.8.1 is the latest uh, pair of you. Um, here I'm using 5.9. <clears throat> and there's a little difference is in the API as to how arguments are passed. The older versions, everything, only a single argument. And if you wanted to have multiple arguments, you'd make it a tuple, for example. 5.9 doesn't require. So, you know, I'll have to make some changes for that. So the first thing that I can do is this, basically change the current directory to be the, the project directory. And so I can use this kind of magic underscore underscore file, underscore underscore, get the absolute path of that, and then just walk up two directories and then change my directory to that. And now everything will be relative to, the, to, the, to whatever project the script came from. This works if you use PV, uh, Python or PV, uh, batch, but not if you run the script inside of Paraview, uh, because when you run it in Paraview, Paraview isn't going to run it as a file. It's going to just load the contents of the file and then just evaluate them. So in this case, I'm going to kind of hard code 
the current file that I have. So basically, by putting all my scripts into that script directory, then I know that if I get that file and I get the directory name of that file, that that's kind of that's the scripts directory. And if I get the directory name of that, that's the parent, then the the parent is the project folder. And so it's always the same. And in this case here, I was hard coded path. And then I have to change all the paths in load state, but also in the save script screenshot, whatever the outputs are in this in, in that file. So let me go and, and do that. So I have another uh, version of the file here that I'm going to copy from. Okay, and now I need to go and and change these, and the changes I made previously are fine because it's it's all um, relative paths, and yeah, perfect. So we're all relative paths. So the other issue is, you know, ideally you'd use the same version of of Paraview for both generating and running the scripts, but usually the the, the um, the changes in the API are fairly small. In this case, here's an example of one small change. So I just have to add, I just have to make the call to layout set size. Uh, instead of passing in two arguments, I just have to pass it in as a tuple. tuple. And so I'm going to go and do that right now. So I'm going to just do a search. Is there a search? No. OK, so here's one. So here's layout set size. I'm going to just modify that. And, and that's the first get layout. Perfect. Let's save that again. Okay, so now I've made modifications to my script so that it, it basically, it'll run in whatever project I, um, that the script currently um, is, is in. And it'll run on the version on Shaheen. It'll also run on the version here. So now what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to try writing the scripts a few different ways. Let me go to the file browser. So here is, is my screenshot file. This, this is, so this is what was made previously uh, when, when I, when I was, was making the, the visualization pipeline and making the script. So I'm going to delete this. And now this directory is empty. And now I want to, I want to basically run this script. There's, there's a few ways that, that I can do that. Let me show you how you can run scripts inside Paraview. So I'm going to disconnect. So there is a view called Python shell. Oh, and it's, and it's here. It's, it's already, already selected. And it's down here next to my animation view. So here's the run script. So I can go and, and run the script that I just made. So that was, if I go to the scripts, that was screenshot example. And I run it. I get my glyph. And if I go and I check on my outputs, voila, it's there. It's back. Right? So we have just created our first scripted visualization pipeline that we can run um, without doing anything else. Now, that's a start, and that shows you that you can kind of you know, use Paraview to both create the scripts, a little bit of editing, but there's, there's better editors out there than what Paraview provides. And we can use it to run the script as well. But let's go to the next step. Let's try running it via PVPython, OK? So first of all, I'm going to delete that one. And I'm going to get, take, get a terminal window. I'm going to go to the pipelines, scripts. And I can now run pvpython. OK, so there's pvpython. It is you know, a, a Python, an interactive Python command line. And so uh, let me just try import. Okay, 
we now see something, something it ran, and we see we now have uh, ah, but a, a different, different one. Um, interesting. That's not not quite the same. So one of the interesting things here is that there's kind of a window that came up, and that's the window where things got would get rendered into. So PD Python is designed to run kind of interactively, and so it it needs for rendering stuff. It needs to bring up a, a window. Let me go and quit that out, and I will get rid of this one again. Let's go and try running PD Bash. So PD Bash basically would, would get what you'd use on Shaheen, um, but you can run it locally as well. And okay, also an interesting. So I'm gonna. It didn't come out the, the exact same way that it was here. Ah, interesting. Okay. Let me try this. I'm going to go and save a, another state file. And I'm going to call this save state ready. So the interesting thing is that we didn't collect all of the, all the changes that we made to the visualization, to the color map might not have come through on the, uh, when we traced out our, our actions. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to saved another state, which is basically just fully up to date. I'm going to do my start trace again. And I'm going to go to load state and go to save state ready. And choose directory, choose data sets. And now instead of doing all the kind of set up to adjust the the visualization pipeline i'm just going to go and save the screen start right away and we put an output and call it ready we'll just increase the size of that save it okay there you go. so the screenshot ready let's go and delete that there go stop trace Okay, I'm going to save that and okay, so if I go and there we go. Okay, so this one preserved everything. A good rule of thumb is, is to do, you know, basically have the state file preserve as much of the state as you need to be ready so that it's basically it's ready to be um, the output so you have your animations already there you have your color maps already chosen so that's probably the best way to uh, to save you work and debugging and figuring out uh, what extra code was required so uh, maybe if we had had run with so maybe if we had run with a tracing more of the changes that were being made, we might have captured the one that was responsible for for setting the the color transfer to what we wanted. So that's so that's basically the first half of the programmable pipeline. So at this point, you could actually, you know, after you've made those changes to the pipeline, you could go over to Shaheen and start and start writing them. Okay. Someone asked um, how to deal with time in the Python script. Um, so there's two answers to that. The first is, is that when time is important and you're doing an animation, the time steps will be specified in the call to save animation. And there's examples that are in the um, programmable pipelines archive that show you how to save out just, you know, just a fraction or, or a subset of the, the time steps of, of, of the animation. And the animation will, will basically figure that out for you. Now, the other part of the question could be, you know, what happens if you want to go to a certain time step and just take a screenshot from there? And the answer is start trace, try it, and then see what Python a pair of you produces. And that'll probably be the, the best way to find out what objects and, and function calls, method calls are being made to, to make that happen.
After the break, I will show an example showing you how to save animations. Welcome back, everyone. Let's go and explore a few other aspects of the programmable pipelines. Let's do an animation and also talk about how to run the batch files and to see some other programmable options for Paraview as well. So I'm going to take advantage of where I'm at with this particular um, visualization. Let me just go and I'm going to change the glyphs and let me color them by something nice. Let's see, okay, so let's color them by, let's color them by um, velocity. Perfect. Okay. Let me also make maybe an animation for this. I want it to be maybe a longer animation. So let's say 90, so the number of frames. So now if I press play, well, not a whole lot happens, but it goes through you know, all, all 90 steps. But what I want to do is I'm going to add a camera and let's go to some orbit. Orbits are easy, so we'll add that. Let's take with the defaults. And now if I So that's what the output is going to be like. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to save my state file. So I basically, I want to save my state just before I go and, and create the output. I'm going to go and save state. I'm going to put it in the save state and then call it animation. So. Okay, I'm going to clear out my environment. I'm going to reset everything. And I'm now going to start recording right from the start. So record, I'm going to load the state. I'm going to load that one I just made. And again, I'm going to do this um, you know, search and I'm going to make it the data sets. And I'm going to go and save out a movie. So I'm going to save an animation. I'm going to save it into the output folder. And double the resolution. Um, the frame rate I will make, it was a bit slow. Let me choose 24 frames per second. Okay, and so now it's going through, I don't know which file format I saved in. I think it was AVI. Yeah, so there's there's three different output formats that we can get uh, for, for animations that are of interest. There's AVI, which is gen generally can be used anywhere, but if you have trouble viewing it, like QuickTime Viewer doesn't like it, then you can use a VLC as a viewer. There's also Aug Viora, which is an open source video format. Uh, not everything supports that, um, but on Linux, there's, there's good support for it. The other way is that we can write out a whole bunch of, of different uh, files as well. So let me go and see what happened. I'm gonna go look at my output directory. Aha, uh -huh. yes, I got a whole bunch of animation files. That's, so let me go and stop the trace. If I go down toward the bottom here, I can see uh, this is where the save animation is happening. So I can also see the frame window. So before there was a question about, you know, how do you specify over what time steps? Here is where you can go and just change that. And there's an example in the programmable pipelines of using a job array on, on Shaheen. And so you run the job array and the Python script will figure out what, what frame range it should be um, writing out. And so because it's writing out individual PNG images, if, if you had a hiccup on a node or some sort of problem, you can just redo just that one section, or you can actually kind of write, create these images in parallel and run a whole bunch of different jobs where Paraview is running on, is just doing kind of a small slice of the work. And then afterwards, when they're all done, you can go and, and, and get them back. Them back.
There's also you know, the issue with the, the file paths again that we would have to go and change to, to run on Shaheen. Let me go and just save that as so. So let me call this innovation sample. Images. Okay, if I look at the images, I, I'm you can see that the different PNGs, you can stitch these together into a single movie when you're done. That's them. I'm going to go and delete them right now. So they're gone. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make an AVI file, but I don't want to go through the whole rigmarole of you know, creating a, a new training script. I just want to kind of modify that existing um, script. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to Tools, Start Trace, then, and I'm going to just go and do my save animation. But this time I'm going to be more careful about what format it's in. I'm going to make it an, an, an AVI file. And I'll call it animation AVI. Um, I'm going to increase the resolution again. It's creating the, the animation. And just to answer the question, someone asked a question about how to create the AVI files or MPEG files from the source images. Um, so, and, and uh, Thomas mentioned FFmpeg, it's kind of what, it's what we use. Uh, it can produce a bunch of different, different movie formats, their video formats. And there's an example of that in the slides for the previous training of how to do that. Let's go and look at our output. It's actually a, a video there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it with the, um, this parole video player. It's very slow. I meant to set the frame rate, but I'm gonna be able to fix that in code. So let me go back and, um, and fix that. In pair of you, I'm going to stop the trace and I'm gonna see what changed. So, so what you'll see here is that, you know, the, the load state command isn't there because I didn't do that. But it has to kind of find out, get, it has to get the renderer, it has to get the layout, it has to get the render view. See that render view? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up in my editor. I'm gonna open up that previous file. So this is the one that I just previously made. Now, I don't like this, the way that it, it saved this animation because it saved it out as a PNG. So I'm going to just comment that out and I'm going to kind of copy and code out of here. So basically I'm just kind of, I can kind of mix and match and combine parts of the code together in the editor. One of the things I have to make sure of is that this render view is kind of that this variable exists and it comes from the same source and it does. So if I look at sort of this new uh, trace, I see that render view comes from the active uh, a render view. And so I, I don't have to copy everything here, right? Uh, if I wanted, I could copy over the new camera position if, if that camera position changed. So I could, I could copy that over. And it looks like it's the same values anyway, and I need the render view that was already, that, that variable was already set up there. And the difference really is just that I specified an AVI, but the one issue here is that the frame rate wasn't set. Okay, so let me go and just find out how to do the, that frame rate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to start a trace, and I'm going to show incremental, maybe I'm going to fully trace everything. I want to set the frame with 24. And I think at this point, okay. So, so here I, I get a new save animation with more information in it. Uh, I get the image resolution. Ah, there we go, frame rate. And um, so I was gonna copy that one over into mine. Cool. 
And um, cool. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to close this one here. We'll save as. This is going to be our fast API. Okay. So let me go and empty out this. These two files. I'm going to go to my terminal. I'm going to go. So I'm going to see what files. Okay, so I've got, I've got. Animation example fast AVI. So let me try running that with PV batch. Okay, and that's done. And that was so that basically that was using that script. I'm going to open it with the uh, other media player. Voila. Okay, so now I have my animation. It plays fast the way I wanted it to. Um, and uh, it's an AVI, not PNG images. And uh, I did that not by you know, doing the whole thing myself, but bits and pieces I picked apart using um, by doing the trace, figuring out what parts of the um, Python code I needed. And I just kind of copied that and, and built my script up. So the beginning examples where you kind of you create this, the, the state trace a script where you load the state and, the, and then save your output, either an animation or a screenshot, uh, gets you a very simple script that needs only minimal modification, but you can also modify that script file even more if you'd like. Now, <clears throat> this script file that I used, I didn't make, I didn't uh, make the previous modifications to run on Shaheen or to run in from arbitrary locations. But you could do that if you wanted to. So let me just quickly close this. And so let's go and look at um, some other aspects of, of where uh, ParaView can be programmed. Um, there are, there's the source, uh, for example, the programmable, programmable source. In the programmable uh, pipelines directory, there is a programmable filters. And there's one called Helix. So we'll, we'll open it up. It's just some Python code that works directly with VTK, with the, with the dead types in VTK. And I'm going to put this code into the script area that belongs to this particular uh, programmable source. And I apply it. OK. And what we get, it's a little hard to see, but cool. We, we get a bit of a. Um, DNA sequence, DNA elements. Cool. So one of the things that we can do is just is there's a, I think under um, display or visualization, there's a, a way to basically show it as, as tubes. Um, but I'm going to do that programmatically. So I'm going to go over to my uh, programmable pipelines. And I'm going to go look at, there's a, a script that I previously recorded called pie shell render tubes. And what it basically does is it gets the active source, which is going to be my programmable filter, gets the current render view, gets the display properties for this, the programmable source, um, it gets those and their display, and it sets the, the, um, the render tubes to be, it renders the lines as tubes. And you'll see basically when I run this inside ParaView, the tubes will get fast. So let me go to the Python shell again. Um, you could enter in things line by line. Let me just, let me just see if, the, if this just, just works. OK. Voila. And it does. Similar to IPython, where you can enter in you know, a bunch of different lines and it, it handles them correctly, the Python shell in ParaView also does the same thing. And now we get kind of a tubular view of these. There are some examples. In the parallel Python, there's another data set. Let me just let me just go and load that. I'm going to clear this out. Just load the state. So it's this disk out. So this is an example where uh, these streamlines here, 
were created from this programmable source. And that programmable source is what I just had made. Uh, what, what you can do is if there's particular areas of your data set that you're more interested in, you can programmatically put in the source points with the right distribution so that the streamlines that come off and things of like that, that basically the sampling is what you would like to make the streamlined visualizations look, look better. And so that's basically the source for the stream tracer with, with custom source. And if I hide the, so and basically this part here is the stream tracer that, that came off that source um, for the disk out data set. And there's an example, there's example scripts to be able to run this with, with PB batch and, and uh, I'm in Shaheen. Let me go and explore that. So basically I'm looking at the Sh at Shaheen's Luster file system scratch directory here. <clears throat> and I basically have a copy of this programmable pipelines. So what I would basically do is I would just do S batch and in launchers, there's, there's two here. There's a simple uh, PV batch. Let me just go and, and just show you what's inside this one here. So in this one here, this is the kind of the very basic, you know, running PV batch with my particular script. I have kind of the standard resource specifications at, at, for, for Slurm at the top of the file. I just ask for one node, but four tasks. Uh, I change into this particular programmable pipelines first, just so that my relative paths are going to work. So I could, I could run it from anywhere um, and it will still work. So you don't want to use module purge on Shaheen. You probably already know that. The module commands I need to get access to pair view uh, are these. I first have to use XC40 modules and then load pair view. I'm loading a specific version. And then it's just srun pv batch force off screen rendering. And then I just pass in my script and, and that's it. So there's another one here for working with arrays. And really the only difference is, is that here I'm requesting an array of, of jobs. So I'll end up with, with 16 different jobs. Well, actually not 16. I'll end up with uh, four different jobs. So the stride for the jobs will be four. And I'm going to run this animation PNG array script, which is a script that I started off generating in pair of you, and then I went and modified. So let me go and show you what's in that one there. The initial changes seen as before is just to enable us to use relative paths by changing the current directory to be relative to the script file. The other thing that I'm doing is I'm going to set up, basically I have to figure out what frame I start on and what frame and how many frames I, I want to to, uh, to make. And I do this based off of the Slurm array task ID and Slurm array task step, uh, which are environment variables that Slurm creates for us based off this job array. So based of that, and I gave default values of 10 and 10, just in case uh, we weren't being run as part of a job array. And then the other change that I made was at the end of this file right here in the frame window. So remember before that was kind of like we had hard code with some numbers there, zero and 96 or something like that, but I can just put whatever I want. And so I put the frame start uh, to the frame start plus the frame count. And that's the range of images I'm going to extract. So this is basically going to save the animation, but it's going to save them as PNGs. And so they'll end up being numbered PNGs that I will be able to, that I'll be able to convert into a movie afterwards. So that's an example of how the bat script and the the pipe and the pair of you script can kind of coordinate with each other. Okay, that gives you a sense of how to create these programmable pipelines and how reasonably easy it is. You don't have to know a lot of pair of you to create them. They can be fairly powerful. You can start with the basics of creating the uh, the save state, which is basically, you know, everything set up all the. Uh, the, the visualizations, the rendering, the views, even the animation sequences can all be set up there. So all you need to basically do is just trace the uh, loading of that uh, state file 
and the creation of the animation of a screenshot or whatever output you want. And that gives you a very small script that you can touch up so that you can run on Shaheen. And you can also go beyond that. You can start to kind of create patchwork scripts that you kind of modify, add little bits, add new bits to it that you kind of have learned by exploring the, the, the tracing output that, that Paraview provides. You've also seen how you know, that programmability is also part of the, the filters themselves. Um, and we saw an example of just a, a programmable source that was used to drive a stream tracer. And you can take you know, the scripts that you save out and run them from the command line in different environments. You don't have to have a GUI uh, available to, to, to make them work. I want to just quickly cover one other aspect of where the of where these pipelines can be put, uh, of where they can go, and kind of the power that it opens up when you can create uh, custom programmable pipelines. I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, but I want to talk a little bit about in situ co-processing pipelines and a tool that Paraview has called Catalyst that wraps up basically the VTK pipelines and the MPI and other stuff that lets you basically take your pipelines and run them inside the simulation. So uh, why would you want to do that? The standard workflow that we've kind of explored for creating the visualization is a post-processing workflow. Um, you basically, you do your simulation, you save all the files out, you incur an IO cost for sending the files across the network and then a, a IO cost again for storage, how it takes to store those files. And then when you go to, to do the visuals, uh, the visualization, you pay another, incur another cost where you have to transfer and load that data over the network uh, to get it into pair of you when you, where you go and do the, the visualization results. There's a number of pros and cons, but the main pro is that it's simple and, you know, you can kind of separate things out. The, the biggest con for now is that your data files sit around and take up a lot of storage space. On Lustre, that's at a premium. Um, yes, I know that there's a new, that there's a, probably extra storage coming. Having a Lustre getting full over 70% starts to impact performance and uh, for other users as well. There are, there are some costs, but for the most part, you know, we have enough storage. People aren't really concerned about that. But I want to explore these other options, which you can, have is instead of <clears throat> splitting these two aspects, the simulation and the visualization into two separate steps and having the file system intermediate, you could actually connect them together. And there's a tool that, that um, is provided part of Paraview called Catalyst. And what happens then is that the visualization basically becomes embedded inside the simulation. And the same scripts that you are using are very similar that you are using to create these uh, visualization outputs and you run with PV batch would actually be run inside the simulation itself. And so what you save is that you don't have to transfer data over the network because it can be read in memory. Um, you don't have to write out to the file system. And one of the things that this gives you access to is, you know, sometimes the simulation, they, they, they compute in between frames that they don't save out because the saving is expensive, but they need those in-between frames to help keep the simulation accurate. When the visualization pipeline is hooked up directly to the simulation, you can now get your visualization outputs at a much higher temporal frequency. So the resolution has increased. And, you know, and because you're saving on file uh, IO and network IO costs, you could then even conceivably increase spatial resolution as well. The visualization the outputs from the visualizations tend to be fairly much smaller than the actual data files. And so what you end up storing ends up smaller and you actually never store the, the, the largest, maybe, maybe a few of the checkpoints, you know, so that you can restart the simulation, uh, but you don't have to save all of them and you save on the storage costs as well. So there is performance potential, especially as you scale up and there is some potential savings, uh, again, by, by reducing file IO and the, the results that you compute are typically smaller. The visualization results are smaller. We'll skip over that. There's also some, there's some variants of this 
that can you know change which file system get gets used or you have you know processes on the same machine sh sharing a, you know a ram disk or memory but they're separate processes the pair of you solution to this is called Catalyst, and basically it wraps up MPI and the VTK and some of the uh, parallel uh, visualization, uh, you know, rendering technologies in pair of you uh, into a library that simulation authors and developers can add to their own code. There have been a number of success stories with this already, um, used at different places, especially for simulations that they're trying to scale up. Um, there's some interesting things that you can do with the cinema formats, which are all, which are basically low resolution formats that still contain some of the information about the different variables. So you can do a little bit of the exploration afterwards, um, not as much. You still have to think a bit beforehand about the um, what the visual pipeline will be. Some interesting cases here are having an advection particles um, visualization that can also survive restarts, which is kind of kind of interesting as well. There's an interesting case study here where the, the simulation itself was being done on the GPU. And so Paraview also has the ability to run some or most of its visualization pipelines on the GPU as well. And so they were able to run the visualization pipeline on the GPU so that they didn't have to copy that off the GPU. As we'll see, what ends up happening is that you know the simulation runs, produces its 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 result, then the simulation is paused while Catalyst runs runs the visualization pipeline on the on the memory that the simulation has modified or created that buffer, saves its output and then returns control back to the simulation. It has been used in a number of large cases, a lot large a lot large simulation visualization uh, workflows. So the way that it basically works is that, that the simulation developers would add Catalyst as a dependency. They would make some small changes. I'll discuss those shortly. But Catalyst can read these scripts, similar to what we've been creating, and can read them in. So the simulation doesn't have to be rebuilt to, to run new visualizations. You build it, the simulation once with Catalyst, and then you decide which variables you're interested and what you want to do with them, what sort of outputs you want. What the developer has to do is they they do have to do make changes to their code, but the changes are actually quite small. And, and I know this looks like maybe like pseudo code, like this this must be too small, but this is fairly close to what it looks like, especially if the um, if the the data types align nicely with the the VTK data types, which we discussed at the very beginning of the talk. And basically, there's you know you initialize Catalyst you add in your, your pipelines, which is basically your scripts. And then in the simulation step for the simulation, you uh, after the simulation completes, you will call Catalyst and request a description of what it wants. So a Catalyst is, uh, you don't push things to Catalyst, Catalyst asks you for things. And the reason being is because it knows from its data scripts, it's, it's uh, Python scripts, which variables the script is interested in. And so it doesn't ask for everything, just the things that it needs to, to complete the visualization pipeline. And then what we'll basically do is, is the developer would kind of loop over each field that's being requested, each variable, convert whatever data they have for that field into a VTK data type, and then pass that VTK data type back to the, the, co the co-process routine of Catalyst. And then you call finalize at the very end. Anyway, the developer kind of, you know, their adapter will call out to Catalyst, Catalyst, um, and the adapter may also need to call it to VDK itself to do some of the data type conversions. Um, Cat Catalyst wraps up the Python capabilities that you have seen today. It also wraps up the Paraview server, which is kind of what PV Batch is running with all the rendering um, and, um, and output capabilities that it has. And it sits on MPI, so you can have, just like PV Batch and, and Paraview can be split across multiple nodes and, and tasks, um, so can, can Catalyst. For the developer, they have to, they will need a kind of a developer build of Paraview. We already have that, that's on Shaheen, if you're interested. And then there's 
um, some modifications that you might make to your CMake file to incorporate these extra dependencies, ParaView and VTK primarily. What does Catalyst give you? Um, so for the simulation users, you get to, to use your ParaView skills to create visualizations using tools that you're familiar with. And you get to create them in a nice GUI setting you don't have to kind of code them um, by hand. But if you want to, you still can. It, it takes your knowledge of pair view and pair view visualizations and lets you use it directly in your simulation. And the other thing is that you, with Catalyst, you can have a live uh, preview or live view of what your simulation is doing. <clears throat> you can choose a few variables that you're interested in and you can watch them uh, develop with the simulation. So you can decide if you want to cancel early or not. And the cool thing is, you know, even if you have some raw variables and it's kind of hard to tell directly from them if they're converging to something valid, if the simulation is working because you need to calculate something complex like a vorticity or something, um, you can still do that, that calculation. So that calculation can be done on your local side, pair of you from the data that has been sent over. So there's a number of, of capabilities that accrue to simulation users. For simulation developers, you know, sometimes they will have their own kind of, you know, they need some sort of analytic tools inside their simulation. Um, maybe it's simple things like averages because they kind of want to tell, you know, is the simulation, is it progressing or whatever? And they want, you know, as part of the logging, they may want to log some debug information. Well, instead of having to write, write this kind of analytic code, you could just pass that along to Paraview and let it and, and use its filters to do these sorts of analyses. There's already histograms and, and all sorts of statistical analytic tools and more, and you don't have to write them. You also don't have to recompile your simulation to, to try to explore new aspects of it. What they will need is that, you know, they will, they will have to handle some dependencies. They will need knowledge of VTK to convert data types. But for the most part, it's transparent to the users. Um, it doesn't have to be running. You know, if, if you don't specify, you might just turn it on with a flag. And if it's not turned on, it, it doesn't cost anything. And so there are some resources here. And we're also here to, to help as well if this is something that interests you. So there's a tool that we've developed called InShim2. That is basically it's a co-processing in transit shim for NC2 that helps you bypass the Luster file system by using the, the temporary burst buffer that's available either per job or for short periods of time. Uh, um, and so it's basically designed for existing unmodified sim simulations. Uh, in this case, it was for Wharf, which doesn't have um, Catalyst built in and is a kind of a crafty, complicated code base that would really need the original developers to, to, to kind of modify. <clears throat> so what we did is we wrote a little tool that kind of watches the file system, watches when the uh, file writes complete for the output files, which were netcdf. And then it reads, and then in Shinto would read them in um, off of the burst buffer, which is a kind of a high speed uh, disk cache, um, and then run the, um, you know, read the NetCDF, load the, the variables that the Catalyst pipeline wanted, and then the Catalyst pipeline would produce the output. So th there is, there is opportunities to, to explore that. We can talk about that offline. There are kind of some, some performance trade-offs with that too. And the Enchim2 runs as a separate bunch of MPI tasks. It doesn't interfere with the simulation. The burst buffer has very high bandwidth. Luster is also very highly perform performant, but for very large files, uh, burst buffer uh, can, e can even ex exceed that. If you didn't want to save those files, like if you were in a case where we're running out of quota, and so you wanted maybe to see how the simulation was evolving, or you just wanted the visualization results, then a tool like in Shim2 would be fine. What you could also do is, you know, you save the simulation results out to disk. You can try loading them with ParaView, and you could just run another job that processes those files and produces the 
the visualization, visualization of lens. Uh, with that, I will conclude. Uh, basically, if, if you're interested, please just reach out for us for help if you have questions. So with that, I will say thank you and good evening. Have a good weekend, everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye for now.